Good evening. <laughs> I'm Eugene Rao. Um, it's my honor to be here, and then thanks for sharing your time with me. Um, I have nothing to disclosure about this talk, and no financial conflict related to my talk today. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, slide. <clears throat> okay, so Mr. M is a 42-year-old male, and he's an engineer, as we see a lot in the Bay Area, and then use computer very heavily, to almost 10 hours on, probably a couple more hours at home, and he plays tennis, and then goes to gym when he makes time. He can make a time for that, and he has a. a kids and then they jumped on him and then they had a uh, hold him and he felt a little bit of pop at the elbow and started about a year ago and just usual uh, rest and tr tried uh, ibuprofen uh, didn't work really well went to a primary care physician and the doctors before he came to see us and he had a, a elbow uh, injection with corticosteroid and felt better a few months then pain started again and then he decided to come to see us. Uh, so given the fact that he had a, a other treatment, you know, pain is worse, and he had a history of a little bit of trauma, even though kids jumped onto him, and uh, he didn't get much better, so we had an MRI done. MRI showed a uh, small uh, area of uh, tear or tendinitis uh, at the insertion side of uh, this tendon into the bone. So this is the, uh, actually the ultrasound, uh, what we get uh, when patient visited us. So we use an ultrasound machine sometimes at the clinic level, just like a stethoscope. So you li listen to the lungs. Nowadays, we have an ultrasound in the practice inside a, a patient room. Sometimes we just take a look at the inside of a, uh, uh, the elbow or inside the skin so we can see what's going on a lot faster. And we'll still use an MRI to kind of confirm the diagnosis. Uh, because MRI is more objective findings than ultrasound. So I just brought up uh, one kickoff case, uh, but tendinitis is a very common condition, or tendinopathy. Uh, so it can happen anywhere in our body. Uh, it is very, very common. A 30 to 40 percent of uh, musculoskeletal conditions are related to those tendon problems, and uh, almost uh, more than 10 million people in the United States are suffering from these tendon issues. So as you see in the picture, uh, calcific uh, tendinitis, or just a rotator cuff tendinopathy or tendinitis, and the tennis elbow, so outside the elbow, and the golfer's elbow, which is the inner side of uh, elbow, and also you can have a wrist uh, ten tendon problems, and also gluteal tendon problems outside of hip, or sometimes it's diagnosed as a trochanter bursitis. And you can have a tendon in the knee, uh, runners, uh, a tennis player, some athletes, uh, patella tendon problems, very common. The other very common problem is Achilles tendinopathy, tendinitis. Uh, you may have experienced yourself or you maybe heard about it. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the tendon. I don't want to go too, I don't want to throw too much information. But what is tendon? I mean, it's a strong inelastic collagen tissue. So it's connecting muscle to the bone. So there is a transition point from the muscle to the bone. So in this picture, uh, this is an elbow and the finger, and there is muscle, and then the, the overwrapping portion of a tendon, which is a white in color here, and then the, the muscle portion. And then uh, tendon goes all the way down and attached to the bone here. So it stores the energy, and it works like a spring. So it stores the energy and pushes back. So Achilles tendon, it stores energy. When you run and jump, uh, it can help, help you just generate more uh, power. So let's go a little bit more down. So microscope. So tendon is composed of a dense, regular uh, fibrillar collagen. So tenocyte, which is uh, tendon-producing cells, making uh, collagen molecules. So then this collagen molecules uh, aggregates and make a very small fibrils, just like a one thin string. So then you put them together, then it forms a collagen fiber, and then it gets bigger called, we just call it a primary bundle or a subfascicle. And then those primary bundle aggregates 
then it forms, they form a secondary fiber bundle and gets bigger and bigger and tertiary. So those tertiary bundles uh, aggregate. Then it was covered by uh, sheds called uh, epitenon or peritenon. And also endotenon is also structured in between those bundles. And it work as uh, canal and then nutrients going inside and there's some uh, diffusion of the blood or other uh, uh, you know, uh, su substance going through that uh, uh, area. Also work as a, a sheds holding those structure as well. So uh, I'm gonna just show this uh, picture as well. Uh, when tendon is formed, there is a really, really good blood supply. But once it's formed, there is no good uh, blood supply anymore. Uh, and this is, a, I think, a very important factor. Uh, because of its poor blood supply, once tendons injured, it's hard to repair. So that's why sometimes tendon injury happened a month ago, more than a year ago, and then it becomes more and more issues. It doesn't get better. Sometimes a broken bone fracture have a big problem, but six weeks, eight weeks, months later, almost go back to normal. But tendons sometimes become very, very challenging issues. So, so I just use the word uh, together, like tendinitis, tendinopathy. I didn't use a tendinosis, uh, but I like to discuss a little bit about this because it creates some confusion. So tendinopathy, uh, I think more commonly is a tendinitis, uh, sometimes tendinopathy, tendinosis. They're interchangeably used by patient and also doctors as well because it's just you know, easy to communicate with the patient as well. But uh, tendinopathy itself, kind of umbrella term, is a tendonpathy, so tendon problems in general. So, uh, and it refers to both tendinitis, tendinosis, other conditions as well. So, and tendinitis is itis. So by definition, it's uh, more inflammation. So it could have some inflammatory cells around it. And usually acute problem uh, may have more inflammatory cells. So, uh, we read a call acute condition or actual condition that has uh, inflammatory cells. We may call it uh, tendinitis. And tendinosis is more chronic conditions. And if you have uh, injury and it lasts more than three months, and actually recent studies show that uh, chronic tendon problem, chronic tendinopathy, uh, actually have a, uh, not many uh, inflammatory cells. So. It's not really correct to call it, not right to call it as everything as a tendinitis. That's why we build up some different terminology, tendinosis, and then tendinosis refers to more chronic conditions and actually is a failed repair. So it becomes a more degenerative changes in the tendon as well, just like uh, joints. So these are picture I found. I'm sorry, I didn't put out where I got this picture, uh, but in the far left, this is normal tissue. This uh, spindle shape, the long uh, shape, the yellow uh, cell is tenocyte. And this uh, columns you see here, 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 here is a, a collagen fibers. And uh, this is uh, we call collagen type one, which is uh, very strong and we'll say good collagen. And as we have, uh, as there is some injury to the tendon from the overuse or uh, just acute, uh, acute exercise and injury to the tendon, then uh, there is some swelling, and then the shape of uh, tendon tenocyte, the tendon-making cell changes. And also there is some swelling of other tissues called the proteoglycans and other uh, substances. And as it gets worse, it becomes more chronic, and you see a little thin, uh, line here, this is a collagen three, it's a different type of collagen. It's our body try to compensate it and the, our body try to make a collagen three, uh, type, collagen type three. But this is not as strong as a collagen type one. And they also you see that in the background, uh, in the big line here, uh, that's uh, the blood vessel as well. So our body try to compensate it. If once we pass this uh, window as well, everything degenerate. This is kind of final stage, and then uh, it's called a tendinosis as well. So lots of uh, collagen, uh, type three collagens, but not many uh, type one collagen to support the tendon. So this 
type of tendon may have a little high increase of risk of a rupture or tear or further damage as well. All right, so just summarize a little bit because I talked about anatomy. So tendinitis may be more acute excessive use or um, and then tendinosis may be more chronic use and it's related to repetitive cumulative injury and also uh, it's a poor blood supply to the tendon contribute this condition as well. And as a uh, end result, it causes degenerative changes in the tendon. Uh, other conditions that may cause a tendinopathy is, other than just overuse uh, or repetitive use, uh, the medical conditions as well. For example, uh, antibiotics or other medical systemic illness that can cause a tendon uh, problem, tendinopathy, or sometimes a tendon rupture. There are specific uh, antibiotics. I'm not against it because it's so common antibiotics. We use it all the time. And uh, I think definitely the uh, outcome, uh, I mean, the benefit uh, outweighs the risk. So I think that we need to use that. But there are sometimes uh, antibiotics, which is a cipro levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin, sometimes cause a tendon problems. All right, the common symptoms, uh, if you have experienced any tendon problem or heard about it, so it's a, usually pain, stiffness, swelling, sensation. On our exam in the clinic, uh, it's a focal tenderness. Patient usually come with a ten pain here and then a pain around the focal uh, area. And then stretching, uh, passive stretching hurts. For example, for the tennis elbow, uh, if you stretch your wrist this way, it pulls the tendon down and causes pain there. Also, we can try a provocative tests or a resistance training, so a resistance uh, strengthening. So ask a patient to cock up the wrist like this, then we, we resist it, then it will pull or add more tension to the uh, proximal tendon, tendon here, so it can cause more pain. So that's how we uh, get better idea about tendon problem, uh, either passive stretching or resisted uh, contraction motion. So, okay, and let's move on to the next one. So usual treatment, uh, especially for the acute problem, protection, rest, uh, ice, compression, elevation, it's a general uh, policy uh, tool for acute problems. Uh, and, and then let's go back to the patient we just talked about. So he had a, a elbow pain uh, one year ago and tried the injection. Uh, and then helped him for a while, and then pain returned. So I reviewed some uh, treatment options he went through, and then discussed with him about the protection again, and the rest. So there are two types of uh, wrist splint that we recommend. Uh, this is basically the same thing. So one is called a counterforce brace. The other one, uh, the other one is called, uh, just we call it neutral wrist uh, splint or wrist splint. So this, uh, brace here on the right uh, holds your wrist uh, still. So you cannot move your wrist backward, or you cannot move your wrist forward, or at least you give you feedback, you shouldn't move that much. So it will give you time or chance to get rest, because otherwise, unconsciously, we use a hand all the time for almost all activities we're doing, typing and opening the door, carrying the bag, so so many things. But sometimes, it's really cumbersome. It's not feasible to wear this brace uh, wrist splint all the time. So then uh, we, I recommend the counter, counter first brace. It changes the fulcrum and then it saves this portion of a tendon uh, from here to here getting overloaded. Uh, there are several studies done uh, that show that this wrist splint is definitely more effective than this counter first brace. So I explain to the patient, try this one as much as uh, they can, and try uh, this one when they cannot really use this type of uh, wrist splint. So uh, NSAID, ibuprofen, Motrin, I've just put the genetic name and the brain name together because it's uh, sometimes confusing. Ibuprofen, Motrin, Neprosin, Aleve, Meloxicam, and Mobic. Uh, may work for uh, acute uh, inflammatory phase, uh, by definition, if there is no, not many inflammatory cells, this medication may not work very well. But in reality, in the clinic, we still use it, uh, at least in the beginning phase. I usually recommend the patient just to take a, a f about a week 
a more regular basis. Um, but there is a, something you need to keep an eye on, like an upset stomach, or sometimes it can uh, affect the kidney function as well. So that's something uh, we need to monitor. Uh, but I usually start, the, start with the, uh, this type of uh, medication. So then uh, physical therapy. So physical therapy, uh, there are so many things uh, under physical therapy. So, but important concept with the tendon problem is uh, not only stretching and strengthening, they added uh, eccentric strengthening. So concentric contraction is you fire the muscle and it shrinks, the length becomes shorter. But eccentric uh, contraction is when you bring your arm outside, uh, your muscle is resisting the force because otherwise your arm goes all the way out. And this is a, a eccentric uh, stretching, elongation of the muscle and the tendon. So uh, adding this eccentric training uh, may be beneficial for uh, tendon uh, treatment because when there is a tendon injury, it forms together, our body reacts to that. It builds up more uh, collagen tissues as you see in the picture, but by adding the eccentric training, it may form and align and add a more tensile force. So eccentric training became an important uh, concept of rehabilitation. So it, it takes a time. So in the very beginning, we try to control pain and inflammation. And the next phase, uh, eventually we add a, a try the eccentric training and then uh, more sports specific or uh, activities of daily life specific uh, training for that. Okay, this is uh, not quite new. i just add uh, one or two more things uh, to a conventional treatment and explain why we're doing it. Uh, the next one I want to introduce, in the, anyone familiar with the nitro paste, nitro patch, heard, heard about it? So this is a nitro paste we use a lot in the you know, inpatient unit or it's for angina. So when pe patient or people have a heart attack or a, not heart attack, it was really heart, you know, spasm or angina, nitro paste or nitro dure uh, dilate the blood vessel. So relax the blood vessel, and that's how it was used. But recently, there are several studies was done for the tendon problem. The idea was, as we discussed a, a while ago, uh, blood supply is pretty very poor for the, to the tendon. So to increase the blood flow to the tendon, uh, dilate the blood vessel, and then it improves the blood supply to the tendon. And actually, the study was done. You found that rotator cuff problem and Achilles tendon problem, it seemed to work well. It's a it's good, good option. We may try that. For the patella tendon, somehow uh, it didn't work very well. Don't know exactly why this one worked better and then the other tendon didn't work that well. Uh, but there is another thing you need to keep in mind, though, because this medication dilates the blood vessel. As a result, it may drop your blood pressure a little bit. The amount of dosage we are using is very little compared to what we use for the angina. But it can still drop the blood pressure. And then there's some medication, especially for the erectile dysfunctions, like a Viagra, Cialis, and the other medication. If you use them together, it may really, really drop your blood pressure. So that's, we should not use this medication together with those. And um, other uh, discomfort patient may explain to me, and they may have a little bit of a headache as well because it dilates the blood vessel up there as well. So it may experience a little bit of a headache, but not usually not too bad with this small uh, dosage. So, small dose, yes. So when that nitro patch is used, um, questions, please. What? We're holding questions till the end. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer your question. All right. So, uh, and so that, let's talk about the, the next case as well. So, so Mr. B is a 73-year-old male, and he's retired. Uh, he enjoys his life, and he fortunately had a uh, pneumonia and a urinary tract infection, and took antibiotics. And I think it was one of them was a Cipro. And uh, he, he's, he's out of pneumonia and other infections, but subsequently he notices uh, ankle pain. So he was in, first evaluated as common things like a spine condition, back pain, and the, uh, whether there was a, any nerve impingement, sciatica, uh, didn't find anything. And so we all, uh, also tried, uh, 
he also went through a nerve test, nerve conduction test, if there's any uh, peripheral neuropathy. Test didn't really confirm the diagnosis. Pain became more focal. So MRI was done for the ankle area, and then find the tendinopathy and then small tear the area. So this is an MRI. This is a, a ankle, bo uh, ankle bone here and the bone here, and then this is a tibia, and this is the back of the ankle. So this black area is Achilles tendon, coming all the way down, attached to the bone. This is uh, the muscles and some uh, fat tissue uh, surrounding this. This is normal tissues uh, there. But there is some inflammation inside Achilles tendon, and there may be a small, some tear here. And also, if you see the thickness here, Compared to this normal area, normal portion, this is a lot thicker. So because uh, the normal structure is a quite dense, really dense, it's a packed, but uh, when tendons injured um, and there is more swelling, the uh, swelling inside in between the tendons, collagen structures, and it becomes a thicker and thicker, and that's what uh, happened here as well. So with the ultrasound picture, uh, it's a similar, it's a top portion and the bottom portion. And compared to this normal area here, and it's, it's a lot thicker here, almost twice the thicker than other area. And then that's where you can even see that. You can see that, and you can point it, you can just squeeze it and the patient jumps. And the diagnosis, making diagnosis is not difficult. Uh, and it usually happens not at the insertion site of the tendon, not at the bone. It usually about an inch above, approximately about an inch above the bony part. Um, and so this is a cross-section image of uh, MRI. So this is actually the tendon portion, and there is some problem inside the tendon, some swelling inside. The swelling looks white with this setting of MRI. And, um, so it, this is ultrasound uh, picture of the Achilles tendon in a cross-section view. And after discussion with him, he tried a several treatment, conservative treatment, pain continues, and also to expedite his uh, potential uh, recovery. Uh, the foot and ankle surgeon at Stanford, my colleague, and we decided to try the PRP uh, injections for him. And the patient, of course, agreed with that. And so PRP injection. Uh, this audience is, how many of you heard about PRP injections? One, two, three, okay. All right, so PRP is platelet-rich plasma injection. So it's a derived, derived from autologous peripheral blood. And it's your own blood, just like you go to lab, you do CBC check, just to take a blood about 30 cc's, 60 cc's, or sometimes 10 cc's, all depends on uh, where we're doing injection and then manufacturer. Um, just, a small amount of blood, and then move that uh, blood to the centrifuge machine and spin it about 10 to 15 percent, uh, 15 minutes. Then uh, we'll get the PRP and then we'll inject to the tendon area or wherever the injured area. So this is not very new, actually. It, it has been used for different body parts. Like it was. It was about 23 years ago, 30 years ago, it was used for the maxillary surgeries so to boost uh, recovery. The PRP was used and also used for the skin wound. If there is any skin problems, the PRP was used as well in cosmetic procedures, uh, uh, especially outside the States, um, in Asia, it, uh, they, they use it, uh, PRP as more cosmetic. Uh, you know, uh, the substances than uh, other things as well. Uh, also used a lot for veterinarians, so used for horse, and then there are more data actually came from the horse study, and then uh, we use it for the human as well. So once we centrifuge, spin it, uh, spin it for 15 minutes, we'll have uh, three different layers. Uh, so one, the top portion is uh, plainly uh, poor plasma, it just look yellow, and then the bottom part is red blood cells. So it's a heavier, so it goes all the way down. And then the plasma, there's nothing much inside, so we'll stay on top. And then the middle layer is called the buffy coat, uh, contains the actual ingredient. And it, it contains a platelet and the white blood cells. The platelets uh, uh, have lots of growth factor together. That's why we use a platelet. We're not only using platelet. Actually, we try to use the growth factors uh, coming with the platelets. 
uh, and those platelet uh, initiate uh, those growth factors initiate uh, tendon healing process and assist that. We don't completely understand uh, how it exactly works, but the growth factors are helping the tendon repair. Um, and the white blood cells, uh, they're a little debate uh, whether we should use a high level white blood cell or a low level white blood cells. Uh, and depends on uh, tendon or other structures, we rather use a different concentration of uh, white blood cells as well. So once a patient have a PRP injection, once that uh, our patient had a PRP injection, he may went through, uh, he may go through this process. Very first phase may have a more inflammatory uh, response. So first day or two, they may have a more pain from inflammation, it hurts more, but in two days, uh, uh, in a couple of days, uh, pain goes down. And then from that point, from one week after the injection to the couple of weeks, there will be a repetitive, uh, a repetitive phase. So our body reacts to that fibroblast comes in and it forms more uh, fibers. And then once the fibers formed, it requires a remodeling because most of those things are uh, coming from fibroblasts commonly is a type three collagen, so it's not very strong. So it needs uh, remodeling, and that remodeling takes months and up to a year. So it takes quite a long time uh, for the patient really feel close to the normal or back to normal level. So uh, patient, I usually explain the patient wait at least two or three months, uh, even before you say this injection work for, work for you or not. So first two months it's not gonna uh, show the big difference. Sometimes their patient come to us, our pain is much better, but they are doing, they respond to the injection much better than other patients. So I, I explain to the patient, be patient, wait another two months or three months. This platelet rich plasma injection may expedite your healing recovery from two years to five, six months or shorter, but it's not gonna make uh, that quick, like one month repair is not gonna happen because our body still needs to build up some tissues and we need to train them again. It takes time. Um, so PRP has been used uh, uh, different uh, tendon area. Uh, tennis elbow, Achilles tendon, patella tendon is very common. Uh, tennis elbow, uh, recently, there is a study uh, published recently. Uh, uh, it's a multi-center trial and then randomized. It's a good quality. Uh, better quality than before, and showed a uh, overall better outcome in one year or two years uh, compared to other treatment options. Uh, and we had a first case, the Mr. M, uh, he had a, a tennis elbow problem and he had a corticosteroid injection. We don't recommend the corticosteroid injection that much anymore because basically we are injecting steroid into the tendon and that can damage the tendon more down the road and weaken the tendon. The versa is different because it's not, we're not contacting the tendon right away, but elbow, the needle goes into the tendon right away. So we, we, we don't recommend that uh, steroid injection to the elbow that much anymore. Okay, so, uh, so we remember this the MRI was done and this was done. So, uh, I discussed with him. So PRP is a one option, and uh, also discussed with the other options uh, other than PRP treatment option. Uh, so I want to introduce the other uh, treatment option, which is uh, called a percutaneous tenotomy, and uh, it has been there for many years. And then with ultrasound technique technology, we put them together, and the fast uh, technique was developed. So FAST technique is a focused aspiration of a scar tissue, or there's a different way to uh, you know, translate it FAST, but I'll use a focused aspiration of a scar tissue. So percutaneous tenotomy. Through the skin, uh, incision was made for the chronic tendon problem, tendinopathy. It was introduced, and then, uh, uh, it was introduced many years ago. With recent ultrasound technology, we can pinpoint the needle where the problem is, and this needle tip uh, moves in and out, goes back and forth, back and forth, and then uh, break non-viable tissue, as unhealthy tissue, uh, without damaging much of a healthy tissues. So it's a similar to cataract surgery. This device goes in and then it 
uh, breaks down uh, non-viable tissues and uh, doesn't damage other tissues. Or something similar to you go to a dental office and they, they, go to, they do a dental cleaning. They use uh, some ultrasonic uh, the instrument, something similar to that. So the nice thing about this uh, procedure is you can, we can do the local anesthetics, doesn't require general anesthesia, and then short procedure time. Actually, the tip, con you know, time, the tip contacting the st structure is only a minute or so. And the total procedure may take about 10 to 15 minutes. It's a pretty short, and there is no suture required. They're just a band-aid, they just go home. Uh, recovery is also quite fast. Usually we recommend for two weeks, uh, don't lift anything, wear the wrist brace for the elbow condition, or uh, don't use it, uh, any this motion or weight bearing. And usually six, eight weeks, uh, patient uh, regain uh, quite a favorable outcome. Um, and this is a picture I want to introduce a little bit. So this is a, how it's going to happen. Uh, this is the elbow. An ultrasound transducer is guiding the needle, and the needle uh, goes in and out, in and out. And then while just holding the needle, they actually pedal and then the inside the tip is, inner tip is moving back and forth. And this is uh, uh, what happens at the level. So this is a uh, tendon right here, and the needle is going, uh, needle tip is going in and out, this way, this way, this way. So uh, the procedure, this total needling time is around a minute. May, may last a little bit longer or shorter, depends on the lesion we're treating. Okay, and so the, I think is the next and the last case I wanna show you is uh, Miss S. is a 66 year old female, is retired, and then she's been working in the semiconductor uh, assembly line in the Silicon Valley for 20 or 20 more, more than 20 years. I had a uh, occasional shoulder pain, uh, was not that bad. After uh, retired, uh, she's been doing gardening, Pain relatively started uh, acutely, but uh, uh, didn't dis disappear, and then had a chronic pain, and then uh, came to our clinic, and we had an uh, x-ray uh, done, and we found a small calcific lesion. I don't know how clearly you can see here. This is where the, your rotator cuff come all the way down and attached to the top portion of your shoulder, uh, and there is some uh, calcific lesion right here. So uh, we call it calcific tendinitis or tendinosis. I think a uh, calcific tendinosis might be a, a better term. Uh, and for this patient, after we tried uh, common conservative treatment, uh, patients still have uh, some catching sensation. So we try to do uh, the needle tenotomy, percutaneous tenotomy as well. So uh, I, I work closely with a shoulder surgeon who does arthroscopic and one of the surgeon uh, uh, refers patients to me to try this procedure first, and then if it, this doesn't work, unfortunately, then next option would be the conventional surgical treatment, ar arthroscopic surgery, or other treatment options. So this is what happened. This is a calcium deposit right here, and then this is a bone. The needle is here. Needle goes in and out, in and out, and then it tries to break down uh, the calcium deposit right there. So successful uh, calcium uh, debridement may show a little bit. You can't see very well, but this small portion uh, here, that's your calcium. We could aspirate it out. Um, and then that patient, uh, it, it was painful for a week or two, I have to say, but it gradually, the pain gradually decreases. She was able to uh, move your, her shoulder better without the catching sensation and impingement. So, and then, a patient uh, didn't have to go through the uh, you know, full course of a surgical treatment in her case. So, so just one more time. So tendi uh, tendon problem is a tendinopathy is a general term, uh, just tendon pathy, tendinopathy, and tendinitis is more referred to uh, uh, acute problem. Tendinosis uh, referred to more, refers to more chronic issues. And conventional, uh, non-invasive treatment using a, a brace, splint, and uh, uh, protection uh, rest, 
uh, and also physical therapy can be considered eccentric uh, training as an important uh, concept and idea. Uh, nitroglycerin might be considered. You need to discuss it with your doctor um, as well if that can be a good option for you. And if those are not working very well, and the minimally invasive procedures like uh, platelet-rich plasma, uh, t percutaneous tenotomy can be additional option. Usually in the past, we didn't have this option and then corticosteroid injection. If those are not working for the patient, we have to try the surgical treatment, but uh, we can try the more uh, treatment options like a PRP or percutaneous tenotomy these days. And so, the idea of the treatment, what we are doing in the PRP and the percutaneous tenotomy and uh, dry needling, uh, which is basically needle go in and out without adding anything. The shockwave treatment, you may have heard about it. I, I'm, I didn't touch much about it. But basically, all those treatments uh, try to increase the blood flow, blood supply to the tendon and helps our body to repair ourselves rather than we just jump in and just suture it and fix it. And uh, definitely there is a limitation. There are a lot of things that we need to understand better and we're not sure about it. Uh, but there are more studies going on. Even the one of the project I'm working with my colleague is they're checking it. Uh, we are checking if there's any genetic component or other things. What's concentration? What's the platelet level before and after uh, centrifuge? There are many factors that we need to figure out. We need to understand better. And surgery remains as uh, slow. Uh, the treatment uh, for uh, refractory conditions you may experience. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the stem cell. I'm uh, just tell, telling you there is some group uh, trying to use a stem cell, which is a mesenchymal stem cell from the, our own body, and then using uh, they use it for the rotator cuff problem as well. Uh, I've seen that uh, from the website, the clinical.gov. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, the people are trying to use the different things, different treatment options for the patient. Also, uh, check with your doctors. And then there are some, uh, you know, there are more David evidence accumulating in positive way or also negative way. It may or may not work. So when you have a question, the issues like that, I suggest they'll check with your doctors who have some experience with that. Okay. And that's pretty much it. And all right, I'll take some questions. All right. I think I'll probably start from, is it okay? If she had a question, um, right? Oh, so when you had the nitro cap, yes. and you talked about the dilation, the, the dilation was a systemic effect, but if it's, you know, say it's a supraspinatus tendon, do you put it right near the tendon, yes. or if it's on the Achilles, you put it on the Achilles? Yeah, yeah. The Can you repeat that question? So question is, oh, if you use a nitroglycerin patch, whether we use it for the focal the injured tendon or Anywhere, right? So, if most of the study was done, it's just targeting the where the injury is. So, it's local. so a little bit of local. Look at the cardiac effects. So, I mean, obviously, you say the low blood pressure, but yeah, low blood pressure can happen. Yes, it can happen. I had a patient who report, reported a headache and then mild, uh, mildly low blood pressure, uh, but those the doses are much lower than the usual dosage for the uh, heart, you know, angina. So, I. I explain to the patient just drink a plenty of water, the tank up first, and then take the medication before they go to bed because that patch needs to be on 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So that's what I usually recommend. So, uh, yeah, and until patient get used to that uh, patch, um, I tell them to monitor their blood pressure or their symptoms, the headache, and, and some nausea and other symptoms as well. Okay. Question? I wondered if you could tell about what mm -hmm. kind of treatment you use for the quervains mm -hmm. tendonitis? Okay, so the, yeah, the quervain tendon, tendon is tendon coming from here, starting from here. There are two tendons coming all the way down and it comes to the thumb area. So when you move your fingers and texting or carrying books and the usual motion, it's also called the mommy wrist, mommy's wrist or mommy thumb. When the baby is very young and little, they are light. But as they get heavier, mom is keep picking up the baby, and then they can have a decuvain's uh, tenosynovitis and it's ten, ten, tendinopathy as well. Uh, the option is uh, what we have is a similar, the where the uh, wrist brace, 
And then when you wear the wrist brace, you need to wear a very special brace, uh, not the common brace for the couple tunnel, something that covers the tendon here. I think she's wearing that one. So it needs to cover the thumb. So this part of a tendon doesn't move that much exactly. So try that option. Uh, steroid can be, uh, cortisone injection is still used uh, to cover in uh, kinosynovitis. And uh, you can do, people do just a just landmark guided, or uh, I use an ultrasound guided injection as well. Just try to minimize any uh, risk of a needle penetrating into the tendon uh, as well. And PRP or this treatment, I think uh, we don't have uh, much experience yet. I've seen uh, some case uh, reports using those uh, different uh, new treatment options, but we don't have any good set of data to even support it yet. So uh, what if you? Uh what if a brace doesn't do a lot of good, and what if the injection of cortisone yeah. doesn't do much good? Yeah. Then so, surgery? Hmm? Surgery is still the uh, last option. They go inside in and debride uh, uh, some tissues, uh, injured, damaged tissues. And if there, sometimes there is a tendon tear, so it can be a tear in, uh, in the longitudinally, just following the tendon track, and then they can go and they may need to it may need to be repaired as well. So uh, for this case, the kind of different treatment, the PRP or other percutaneous tenotomy, we don't have much data. So that's really alternative treatment, meaning maybe it's not very dangerous for you with no, no harm, not much harm, but we don't have any strong evidence data to, to explain to you that it's gonna work for you. What about releasing mm. the sheath that the tendon is in? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a part of a treatment, not surgical treatment option you might have. Gotcha. Do we get re <clears throat> referrals to you or your uh, department for people? E How do you get referrals? How do you get referrals? Uh, uh, I'll give you my <laughs> phone number as well. Or you can uh, yeah, probably I ask your I primary care. Yeah, a primary care physician. And uh, you can primary care physician, if they're inside a Stanford system, they can use just electronic system. And then I'll leave the phone number here. And they can just call this number, the new patient coordinator, make an appointment, I think. Thank yes? Is there any <coughs> evidence that anything that comes through the digestive tract, like glucosamine and chondriatin, actually does any good? For the tendon. Mm. So the question is, uh, Glucosamine chondroitin has a positive or beneficial, is a beneficial to the tendon problem, tendinopathy. Um, I know we use it for more uh, cartilage issues, uh, cartilage damage, like oleoarthritis, but tendinopathy, we don't, we don't recommend it uh, that much. We don't even try that option that much. Not that I know of. Yes? Uh, how does steroids uh, weaken tendons? Well, steroid, uh, uh, the question is uh, how steroid weaken the tendon. Uh, the steroid, when it's uh, outside, the, uh, outside, the ten outside the tendon, it doesn't really penetrate it. But once it penetrates in, it affects the uh, structural uh, molecules like uh, collagen and other things. It also creates some uh, uh, swelling of the uh, tendon as well. So uh, from the dense, really dense fiber, and then it, it becomes, it eventually uh, destruct uh, some other uh, protein and collagen substances. Yes. What's the best approach for a gluteal strain? So question is, uh, what's the best approach for the gluteal strain? All right, okay. So uh, strain is referred to more muscle problem. But I think a gluteal tendon, the muscle becomes tendon anyway, so it's a, First, we need to figure out is a true gluteal strain, which is a more only isolated muscle problem, which is very rare, and probably more related to uh, gluteal tendinopathy or the bursa surrounding that uh, tendon and gluteal muscles. So, we uh, need to control, we need to figure out where is the problem is coming from. Sometimes spine issues spine problem or nerve impingement can refer down or a spine joint problem, facet joint we call it, can refer down to the ten, uh, those area or you can have a tendon tear. 
So if you tendon tear, usually surgery is not recommended. We recommend a non-operative treatment as a first option. And uh, if there is a tendon issues, tendinopathy or small tear, recommend the patient do more rehabilitation, uh, strengthening, uh, and it takes a time. And then basically you have a, you lost, if you lose 20% of tendon, you may want to compensate with remained normal tendon. So you need to build up those muscles and uh, make tendon stronger. And other options is remain the same. If it's a bird's eye issues, you can, uh, you can try to uh, uh, steroid the injection to the bird's eye, not to, into the tendon. And uh, I know some, uh, some patients get help from those type of injection. Uh, PRP injections, if there is a calcium deposit, they try to uh, remove that uh, calcium. But those are uh, more alternative treatment. Try to all conservative treatment first, and then try it as a uh, next step. Okay? Right. So, How do you evaluate friend. if someone's a good candidate for the PRP or their tsunami? Uh, question is how do we evaluate uh, someone's good candidate, good, someone's good candidate for this type of treatment. Um, so this is how we usually approach. I mean, we try to still use a conventional treatment, uh, you know, price and other the physical therapy as a uh, option. And then um, after that, and patient doesn't really respond to those treatment. And, and if there is a significant tear, like for example, there's a full tear, complete tear, those patients may not be a good candidate for those alternative uh, treatment options, but a uh, patient has a partial, partial, very small tear or partial tear, I mean small tear, or a tendinopathy, more likely tendinopathy, uh, tendinosis, those patients may be a better candidate uh, for those tr uh, treatment. So uh, try the first, uh, the approach is like this, rule out very dangerous or significant situation like a full tear uh, or complete tear and then try a conservative, conservative treatment, medication or rehab, uh, doesn't work, and then we'll might discuss with the patient about those treatment options. Uh, whether PRP or percutaneous tenotomy, which, which one's working better than, one is better than the other, we don't know that yet. So it, it's a hard, uh, you know, figure out the PRP versus, there is some financial, you know, component. <laughs> related to that as well. I think one is covered by insurance and then the other one's sometimes not covered by insurance. Um, so there are the more factors you need to discuss with the patient as well. Sounds like the tenotomy would have a much quicker uh, recovery time. Uh, tenotomy, even, even it says it's a two to six weeks they make a recovery, but uh, I think it'll still take a few, I mean, you know, few months to, until the patient feels much better. So it still takes time. I don't think both are not providing, you know, quick relief, relief for the problem, tender problems. Any question there? I had something called spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis. Uh, spinal stenosis is no. There is no tendon involved with that. I mean, tendon is more ligament involved. So spinal stenosis, uh, by definition, is just narrowing of the spinal canal. So either it can be related to uh, bone spur, and then there's a ligament holding your spine. Uh, it can get thicker as well because our body takes cumulative stress uh, uh, to our back, and it gets bone gets thicker, uh, bone gets bigger, bone spur there, ligament gets thicker. As a result, it makes the uh, spinal canal narrower. So that's what we call spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis itself may 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 not cause a pain. Is it? Uh, spinal stenosis and irritates some structures, either joint or nerve, then you may have some pain going down to the leg. Uh, I think she had a question, yeah. Uh, when we do our stretching exercises, yeah. like the Achilles, Achilles, you know, the yeah. and the foot, are we stretching the muscle only or the muscle and the tendon? Uh, if you do stretch, the question is if you do stretching for Achilles tendon, whether you do tendon only or muscle and tendon together? Is a question? Yeah, it, I know the muscle stretches, but does the tendon also Yes, yeah, stretch? you're stretching tendon. The tendon yeah, tendon as well. as well, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes, you, you when you do a stretching exercise, uh, resistance training, you you stretching tendon as well. But yes. when you stretch, I noticed in your demonstration, you didn't go straight out. Mm -hmm. You came this way and back, this mm -hmm. way and back, but not this. Oh, so question is how we really how do we stretch the yeah. elbow? Uh, for the uh, tennis elbow, let's talk about the tennis elbow. You can pull your arm out. You can stretch this way, and then you can stretch it this way. I just demonstrated the example of a concentric uh, strengthening and an eccentric. Okay, you did go straight out. Yeah, go straight okay. out. I mean, stretching itself, you need to go straight out. Uh, the, the picture I showed it to you was try to show eccentric training. So eccentric training is resisting you know, the muscle, let's say the, some, you have a weight here, pulling your arm out, you try to resist it. So then that will add some eccentric force to the biceps tendon right here. Okay. Yes? In the case of a rotator cuff problem, rotator cuff problem? due yes. to a trauma, fall. Fall. Okay. <clears throat> the pain is stapling down over a three, four month period of time. Yes. So now the question is, do I carry on like that or do I need to have some MRI done, some activity done? Because over the long term, yes. it will calcify and create a longer problem two, three, four years down the road. Mm -hmm. So do I worry about it now or do I worry about it later? OK, so the question was, if you or someone fell and they had some shoulder injury, and then pain is a little bit better now, uh, then whether we should get more tests done, evaluation done, like MRI now, or we can wait. And if you don't do anything, does it cause more damage? Exactly. Okay, so uh, if, if you have a fall, I mean, uh, this is what we need to check first. I mean, there are several things we need to check if, there, if you have a weakness, profound weakness, you can lift things. Uh, those are more concerning things. When we treat those musculoskeletal condition, it's a pain and function. I think those are two important factors. So either you have a significant pain and you can function as normal or function at the level you likely be, then that's something you need to get more evaluation. Uh, by not treating your shoulder right now, it's gonna damage a lot more. Probably not, yeah. So it will eventually, for sure, cause a calcific tendinitis or tendinopathy. Probably not. And even if you have some calcium deposit in the shoulder or tendon, if you don't have a much problem with the pain or functional pain, there's nothing much we can make it better. So we, and then it's not dangerous, not like a tumor growing, and then you know not life-threatening condition at all. So uh, as long as you maintain your functional level and the uh, in the pain level, then we'll probably monitor your problem. Okay. All right. Yes? Uh, in the case of multiple partial dislocations of the shoulder? Partial uh, dislocation, yes. Yeah, and then uh, continued pain afterward. Would you recommend that that's probably a tendon problem? And if so, what kind of exercises would you recommend? So multiple partial dislocation. So this is a little different topic than <laughs> what I present to you. Uh, less likely is a uh, tendon. The question is, uh, if there's a multiple shoulder dislocation, is it more likely related to the tendon? Uh, probably not only tendon. There's other structures uh, provide the stability of the shoulder. Uh, a tendon is one of a, a stabilizer. It provides stability, but there's also a structure called the labrum. And the labrum is a sheet lining connecting your shoulder joint uh, to your arm, humerus, and it provided when you rotate your arm too much or it may have uh, some tear. Sometimes you have a ligament issues there. Ligament is the you know, collagen tissues connecting from bone to bone. So then those, those are multiple issues. So probably not only, if you have a dislocation of a shoulder, multiple dislocation. Uh, multiple partial dislocation. Multiple partial dislocation, okay. Uh, I think it's still, you need to evaluate other, other conditions. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. This is terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time.